Welcome to Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Zalewski from Condo Vultures. If you're tuning in this podcast, you're going to hear a conversation by current and former journalists talking about some of the biggest stories that have occurred within the last few weeks or so. What are we talking about on this episode, which is episode 11 of season five? Well, we're going to talk about a condo association. What happens if the board suddenly ghosts unit owners? We're also going to talk about banks. They're selling off loans on office space. Is it a precursor? So what's happening? What's going to happen to the office market, office space market? We're also going to talk about restaurant chains. Quite a number of them are closing down locations and possibly even shutting up shop all together. We're going to go to our food expert, John Fackler, to give us some input on that and what's happening in South Florida and Miami. Also, too, another story. Condo markets getting flooded with supply listings in Southwest Florida. We'll discuss that. We're going to get into the multifamily, uh, some challenges the owners of multifamily are facing. Well, we'll talk to the uh, reporter who wrote that story. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up with a story about condo associations seizing unit owners parking spaces and renting them out to the highest bidder. So on the other side of the break, we'll, we'll get into our podcasts. Welcome to the CondoVultures.com podcast with your host, Peter Zalewski, a Miami real estate broker, Wall Street consultant, and expert witness. This podcast is focused on identifying real estate buying opportunities in the South Florida condo market, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. The CondoVultures.com podcast is not authorized by the South Florida real estate industry and will most likely annoy many of the region's talking heads. This podcast will feature straight talk and salty language that could be offensive to some. Please remember that part <sighs> past investment success does not determine future gains, especially in the South Florida's volatile condo market. For more information, please visit condovultures.com. This is Peter Zaliski of the Condo Vultures podcast. Before I started doing these podcasts, I was in the business of being a licensed real estate broker, a contributing columnist for the Miami Herald, as well as the Miami a Real Deal, but also extra witness work in consulting. So if you are looking for an expert witness or if you're looking for consulting services, a straight talk perspective as to what's going on in a particular marketplace, a building, or the, what happened previously, for whatever your situation is, whether you are an attorney, whether you are a institutional fund looking to invest, or whether you're a lender who's trying to come up with some sort of a strategy and approach for your lending committee going forward, I don't just want to be able to help you to get a hold of me. Please reach out to Peter at condovultures.com. That's Peter at condovultures.com. Or give me a call to the office at 305-865-5859, 305-865-5859. Five eight five nine. This is Peter Zalewski of the Condo Vultures Podcast. I wanted to alert you that if you have a property that you're looking to sell in the Tri County South Florida area, I would encourage you to reach out to Jenny Corta, a licensed real estate broker with CVRRealty.com. She's my partner. She's been in the business for north of fifteen years. More importantly, she knows the market. She knows how to get that deal done, and she also realizes that it's more important to get a price that you can accept and sell the property rather than the hold firm on some price that's never going to be achieved and ultimately languish on the market. So if you're looking to do, do a deal that you want a skilled expert who can help you sell a property, reach out to Jenny Hortes at 305-865-5859, 305-865-5859, or visit her website, tvrrealty.com. Welcome to Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Zaliski from Condo Vultures. If you're tuning into this podcast, you're going to hear a conversation by current and former journalists discussing some of the biggest stories that occurred within the last few weeks or so. The objective of the podcast is to cut through the fluff and give you, the audience, some uh, real-time perspective as to what might really be going on. This is a no hyperbole podcast. So let me go ahead and introduce you to the podcast members this week. We have uh, two of our regulars. We also have a visiting journalist. Let's start off with one of our regulars. We have a gentleman who was a journalist for over 25 years. Right now, he has his own public relations marketing firm called Bruce Communications, someone else but John Bruce. You can get him on X, which is his handle is John Bruce at John Bruce, J-E-A-N-G-R-U-S-S. And if you want to check out his website, go to GrusePR.com, G-R-U-S-S-P-R.com. What's going on, Mr. Bruce? Hey, Peter, I'm ready to cut through the fluff. No fluff in this area, no fluff whatsoever. Uh, Mr. Bruce, happy hurricane season. We are yes. now in June, and we are in hurricane season. It's supposed to be one of the most active hurricane seasons in quite some time. I think there's some projection, about 25 name storms or so. Uh, any take on that? Yeah, I think this is going to be the busiest season ever. And you were a bit of a diver. You ever been diving during, uh, not obviously not a hurricane, 
Well, maybe. But uh, what about a tropical storm? Anything like that? What, what's it like below the surface versus above the surface? Well, when the when the water's rough above, um, it's pretty calm below. But um, you just got to get uh, you you really can't get out there because it's too rough. Uh, interesting, interesting. I and mean, that's a perfect segue into talking about rough. We have another journalist on the podcast, one of our regulars. He was a journalist for over 20 years, worked in publications, including the South Florida Business Journal. Right now, he does public relations and marketing. His name is John Fackler. You can get him on X, formerly Twitter. And his uh, Twitter handle is JT Fackler, at JT Fackler, J-T-F-A-K-L-A-R. Mr. Fackler, uh, you have an announcement to make about a brand new business that you've just launched. Unfortunately, you're going to be writing about the New York Jets, which is the NFL football team out of uh, New York City. You're located down here in Miami, which is Miami Dolphins territory. Why don't you give us some perspective? What are you trying to accomplish with the um, with the new business? And uh, are Miami Dolphin fans invited to participate in your new publication? It's actually a sports newsletter. It's called Jet Up Miami. Jet Up is one word. Um, it's something that we as Jets fans know exactly what it is. Uh the reason why I launched it, I found out there's a huge percentage of Jet fans that actually live in uh, Florida. Most, you know, not all, all in South, South Florida, but as far as the state. So um, what we're doing is we're trying to have uh, get-togethers, you know, meet up and greets um, when the Jets come down here to play uh, Miami. And uh, we're, you know, working on uh, establishing a brotherhood of Jet fans uh, who are partake, who actually are in Miami. I know we're going to have a lot of pushback from the Dolphins fans, but that's good. You know, any any kind of publicity is good. Good, you know, good publicity, bad publicity. You, we all know that from being in PR. So uh, that's that's it. I'm with, you know I'm I'm still developing it. I'm doing a few articles, doing this and that. We'll be doing some podcasts as well. They're going to have my ugly mug on there uh, and video, so people could take shots at me as well. But I think it'll. I think it's going to. I think it's going to do well. We'll see. And, and Mr. Faxon, why don't you give us some uh, street cred? Give us your resume. Uh, why should people listen to you as it pertains to the New York Jets? Well, I'm a 50-year uh, Jet fan. Um, you do not look it. I, I do not look that. I know I look younger than that. But, um, you know, I've had 50 years of disappointments, let's just say. Um, you know, I was a fan when Joe Namath, uh, you know, brought them to the Super Bowl. I've got, I had a bunch of photographs. I had a, I even had a signed football that all had the greats on there. Of course, boy, I that must it. be worse. That must be worth a lot of signed football with Joe Namath's signature on it. Yes, I lost it though. Stop, so stop, stop, stop. instead of putting it in a glass case or something and putting it away, I was young and stupid. You know, I was 15, 16. Uh, but I had guys actually visit me in a hospital. I used to play a little bit in my freshman year, and uh, I had an injury, and it turned out to be uh, a tumor. Not cancerous, but they set the Jets set me up. They brought a couple of the guys in, in the defensive lineman John Elliott, one of their free safeties Gus Solomon. They came in, you know, took some pictures, and ever since then it was, you know, there's no going back after that. You know, I can't, I can't transfer to be a Dolphins fan. It's not going to happen. Can Miami Dolphins fans um, participate? And will there be an opportunity for them to comment? Of course they can. I'll be getting a Twitter handle soon, so they can, uh, you know, rough me up via Twitter. They can also subscribe right now for free. And uh, if they want to get fired up, you know, against the Jet fan, please have at it. Enjoy. Subscribe. Subscribe. And it's called jetoutmiami.substack.com. Yes, That's the website? Yes, sir. All right. Fantastic. It's on Substack, by the way. It's a Substack. So you could, you could search it through Substack. Perfect. And what, by the way, what's your author name? In case anybody looks up uh, John Fackler, are they going to find it? Oh, it's Boca Joe. Hapsaka. Which is a Perfect. name that you, it's a name that you came up with, so you could take some credit for. Thank so you. It's, it's throwing everybody off. Like, who the hell is this Boca Joe character? <laughs> perfect, perfect. And who else do we have on the podcast this week? Who's our visiting journalist? This gentleman has been a journalist for over 35 years. He's worked at a variety of different publications. He was even an editor over at the South Florida Business Journal. No one else but Mike Seaman. You'll see his work uh, currently today. You can see it in The Real Deal. You'll see it at Commercial Observer and some other publications in and around. If you want to get a hold of Mike, you can get him on X, which is formerly Twitter. Get him at Mike Seamuth, M-I-K-E-S-E-E-M-U-T-H. 
What's going on, Mr. Seaman? Thank you. I'm suffering. I, I always suffer during the off season when football is not happening, but this year is different because I'm from Iowa City, Iowa, but where Caitlin Clark became the world's most famous basketball player. And now I'm following the yeah, WNBA. True. Wow. <laughs> uh, Mr. Seamuth, where, where can you watch a WNBA? Is it, I mean, can you subscribe to like NBA app and pick it up there or they have their own app? I, I, I have to say, I've never seen any, any games. I've just watched it on ES, ESPN, the main ESPN channel or one of the sister channels. Yeah. Watched, watched a couple games. Is, is she now the most famous Iowan? I mean, obviously after you. Yeah, after me. I've been gone. I'm a Floridian now, I think, officially. I've been in Florida since 1987, so they probably won't take me back in Iowa at this point. Although the governors, have, you've been a, corrupted. The governors have a lot in common, so maybe it would be okay. Oh, uh, interesting. Interesting. Okay, well, welcome aboard, Mike. We're going to have a fun podcast. Let me go ahead and lay out the rules of engagement before we go ahead and get into our podcast. So, what we will do is um, I handpick six stories. I send them to some journalists, ask them to give them a read, and then we're going to turn around and uh, discuss them. Uh, one person will start off commenting on it, and then it'll be open to the floor, and anyone else can sort of chime in. Mike Seamith wrote two of the six articles. Uh, we're going to discuss his pieces. He'll share some insight with us about what was going on. In terms of rules of engagement, anybody has any comments? They want to reach out. They want to ask a question. Get us on X, which is formerly Twitter. Get us at Miami RRP, at Miami RRP, which stands for Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast. Not AARP, but Miami RRP. And uh, another point to bring up to you, the sponsor of the podcast, is actually my my firm, uh, poundofvultures.com. I'd encourage anybody, if you are out there in the marketplace, you want to take advantage of this new rule coming down the pipe. We don't have to pay a buy-side broker anymore. The MLS is now going to offer properties for sale. You don't need a realtor, which, by the way, MLS has broker been licensed since 95. But if you want to go at it alone, you want to DIY it, as they say, um, go to our website. We have a club set up. Uh, we do a monthly meeting, uh, share intelligence. We put out numbers, statistics, and consulting services are also available. So countofultures.com is where you check it out. That's the sponsor. So how you going to get in terms of promotion from this point forward? Let's go ahead and get into our podcast. Um, we're going to start off with Jean Gruce, story number one. Jean Gruce, uh, I'll read you the headline. I'll read you the first couple of graphs, and I want you to comment, Mr. Gruce. We will start off with a story that's coming out of the Palm Beach Post. Palm Beach Post, here's the headline. Owners say condo board ghosting them after skipping inspection, not insuring building. And here we go with the first couple graphs. And by the way, this is a Q&A. This is a regular feature that appears in the Palm Beach Post. There's an attorney who specializes in uh, condo law and people write in. Uh, the articles are, 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 are the, the letters are, are typed up and then we're going to get the responses from the actual attorney. Kind of like a Dairy Abbey, if you will, for condo associations. So here we go with the question. We're in a 64-unit condominium that elected a board in 2022. This board replaced a previous property manager for no apparent reason. Since then, there have been no elections, and they aren't giving us any information. We're prohibited from contacting any board members directly at the risk of a fine. But the new licensed community association manager is totally unresponsive. We're due for a 40-year building inspection. And even though they told us at the beginning that everything was fine, we discovered that we lack property insurance for almost a year, and we have been cited by the county for not completing the inspection. Story goes on to mention a variety of other things, but Mr. Chris, um, you know, why don't we go to you? Why don't we get your comments, A, about the letter, and B, what this, uh, this condo association uh, attorney says, and then maybe we can kind of kick it around and see what everybody's perspective be. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the moral of the story here is, is um, prepare to sue or be sued. Um, because, uh, that's the only way to resolve those kinds of issues. Actually, there's another way to resolve that issue and that is to just sell your unit. Uh, get that, <laughs> get the hell out of there. I mean, it sounds like, it sounds terrible. Um, it sounds like a terrible situation. And, um, I, I would definitely, um, uh, consider selling, a uh, my unit if I lived in a condo where the association was this poorly run. You know, you know, Mr. Gruce, before I open up to the floor, um, I forwarded on to you a, an email I got from a law firm. And the law firm basically summarized uh, one of two bills that Governor Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, is expected to sign. Uh, what I sent on to you and what was published by this, uh, this, this attorney uh, basically was laying out what's going to happen with homeowners associations. So let's say horizontal type of communities, you know, the houses, townhouses, 
And there's another one that's supposed to be signed uh, relatively soon. That's from the condominium association. But in going through that, one of the things I noticed, and it lays out all these new requirements for associations, is that uh, information has to be made available. Information like what this letter discusses that was written in the Palm Beach Post. Um, information has to be made available, but it doesn't have to be shared with the public. Any thoughts on uh, uh, this new requirement, which will kick in July 1st, where associations have to share information, but only with unit owners and no one else outside of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I we've talked about this before, but I, I thought they'd missed, the legislature missed a, an opportunity to uh, basically make HOA documents public records. Um, so that, you know, we could shine the light on, on these HOAs and especially on the ones that are poorly run, um, so that, uh, they essentially would be shamed into, uh, cleaning up their operations. And who knows how many of these HOAs are, are, are poorly run. And, um, my guess is many, many of them. In fact, I, I would be, um, I would be very leery of buying any real estates, uh, in a, in a community that that was governed by an HOA, because you really never know uh, what what's going to happen uh, down the road, and you don't know what the liabilities are until you're an owner, and then it's too late. Um, so I I just think uh, and, you know the other thing too is that the enforcement of these uh, new laws. I, I just don't know how it's going to be managed. There's so many HOAs, so many problems with them, and it's only going to get worse now with with the um, new requirements that are set to take, uh, take on in, in 2025. So I, I just, um, it's just a kind of a, uh, it's going to be the wild west out there. Mr. Mr. Fackler, you used to write about white collar crime uh, when you worked over the South Florida Business Journal. Um, the question I have for you is in going through this attorney's uh, opinion, if you will, of the HOA Homeowners Association and the Condo Association uh, uh, legislation is supposed to be coming relatively soon. But in going over it, it, it says there's actually criminal liability now for, uh, for property managers as well as board members who aren't adhering to. Now, it says multiple offenses or multiple times, actions, and I'm not an attorney. Check with your attorney. But um, Mr. Fackler, is that overreach by the state of Florida to actually threaten criminal uh, proceedings against somebody who volunteers to be on an association board and then somehow uh, 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 breaks some of these uh, these new laws that are coming yeah, I, hypothetical. I mean, of course. Uh, I mean, it's this has been going on now for God knows how long. Um, it's things have gone from good to hell, and we've been waiting for some criminal, uh, uh, you know, legislation involved in these uh, associations. I mean, it's been it's been so bad lately. I mean, finally we're starting to get reporters up boots on the ground including several of our guest uh, reporters who did a great story recently, really doing a deep dive. Um, you know, there was some, at some point, they were talking about having a statewide call incentive where people could complain. That got, you know, somehow they got taken out of the legislation. But now, apparently, the criminal element, uh, there was um, an issue where it was only misdemeanors. And now I think they're talking about felonies. Not too sure. I don't recall uh, what, what what it had said, you know, and, and I guess uh, last question related to this, just as it opened up to the floor, um, I'm just wondering, you know, there's always been a reputation of condo commandos. Those are the people who go around, they enforce the rules uh, with an iron fist, if you will. Is this, you know, what, what kind of effect does this have on condo commandos? Are they going to, are they going to now use this as justification to crack skulls even more than they than they had uh, out of risk that maybe they can be facing something. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Do we need Let more condo commandos? I mean, it sounds to me like there's there's a laxness, there's a lax attitude in some of these HOAs. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I remember talking to you recently, Peter, about this blacklist that's going to be coming out, so-called from the, from Fannie Mae, listing uh, Correct. condominiums and... HOAs that are just not getting it done in terms of financial, structural, and other safeguards. And if 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 indeed that thing, well, I'm I'm not sure. I we got a, I got a different response from Fannie Mae when I actually contacted them about there is no blacklist. They said, but then they described something very much like a blacklist. Uh. But it's only available to, <laughs> to only available to bankers. It's not really available to the public at this point and i'm i'm uh it would be it might be helpful again 
if they became public, just like you were saying earlier, may shame people into doing the right thing. I mean, we can't have another surf site in Florida, period. Period. I would never serve on a board, ever. I have a friend who regrets the day she started, but she's, she's trying to defend her yeah, investment yeah, yeah. in her condo, you know? And, you know, they just haven't yeah. been doing the right thing in terms of getting their certifications lined up and all that sort of thing. Thankless job. Thankless job. Mr. Fackler, you want to add anything to that? No, I listen. I, I totally agree. I think it's a thankless job to begin with before everything, all the shit hit the fan, so to speak. So I think it was always a thankless job. I mean, I never understood people doing it. My father himself was on a condo board and he was, you know, he's not exactly the, uh, he's more laid back. He didn't last long either, so. Fantastic. We got something else to look forward to. This is like the witching hour, the, the uh, second half of this year when it comes to condo associations. Because keep in mind, uh, when you get into 2025, you got that uh, condo association financial <laughs> And you also got the realtor association and the commission issue that's coming to a head as well. So this will be a very interesting second half of 2024. Let's go on with story number two. Um, Mike Seamus, we're going to go to you with story number two. This is a piece you wrote. It appeared in the Commercial Observer. I'm going to read you the headline first couple graphs. Maybe you can provide some insight. You wrote the story. You might not be able to comment, but uh, and once you provide some insight, we'll open it up to the floor. So here we go. Commercial Observer, uh, your piece, Mike Seamus. Lenders, especially banks, are starting to sell a lot more loans on office buildings. Subhead, amid high interest rates and stubborn vacancy, lenders appear to be offering to sell substantially more loans secured by commercial real estate properties. And here we go with the first couple graphs. Money losing sales of loans secured by offices and other types of struggling commercial real estate are gaining momentum. Banks in particular appear to be offering to sell substantially more loans secured by office buildings and other commercial properties than they put on the market last year. For example, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, CIBC, agreed to sell $316 million worth of loans on office buildings in Austin, Texas, Phoenix, Arizona, Seattle, Washington, and San Francisco at a discounted price, according to the Financial Post. Also, in the last couple of weeks, Bloomberg reported investment bank Morgan Stanley plans to buy about $700 million of commercial real estate loans from a group including Blackstone, Rialto Capital, and Canada Pension Plan uh, Investment Board. The CRE loans had been on the books of failed signature bank. Mr. Seamoth, it sounds like the lenders are effectively agreeing to do short sales where they're selling these loans less than what uh, they're owed. Uh, am I reading that right? And what can you tell us about what you found when you were reporting out the piece? Well. One of the things that I found out was that um, there's a lot of private capital around to, uh, to uh, there's a lot of funds that have been set up. You know, you mentioned Blackstone there. Oh, I'm sure that was a fun. So there's a lot of dry powder out there to do this sort of thing. I think there's more of it going on, according to one source I was talking to, more of this going on than is realized because many banks which have poorly performing commercial real estate loans are simply selling them to other banks or finding other banks and they're doing it fairly quietly. And you don't find out like the day it closes, you might find out, you know, in some quarterly statement later on, not making a big deal out of it. So I do think it's gaining momentum. And, and one takeaway I had from this, I did kept asking people, are there any parallels to what's happening with commercial real estate loans now and what was going on with residential real estate loans? in the 2008, 2007, 2008 uh, financial crisis and housing market crash. And uh, I kept hearing back, no, because it's different this time that the private capital is so much bigger, <laughs> part of, so much bigger part of the picture than it was back then. There wasn't any capital to do anything back then. You know, they just, you know, bailed out the banks and tried to, you know, rebuild the government did. In this case, I'm hearing now that there's just plenty of private capital out there, and that's going to cushion what could be a painful impact to the banking system uh, going forward. But, you know, the alternative is to is to foreclose on the loan and take the property. You know, and if it's if it's if it's a, got a 50 percent occupancy rate and then it's office. And that was what we really focused on was office in this story. What, you know, I mean, yes. what are you going to do with that? You know, so, yeah, you're losing money on the on the loan, but Lord, who knows how much you're going to lose if you take back the property at this point. Mr. Seamoth, just a quick follow-up question before I open it to the floor. 
I'm just wondering, um, what, was there a catalyst? Was there some trigger as to why you're suddenly starting to see the sell-off begin now? Is it a possibility to maybe front run the market by some of these lenders who basically want to get out before everybody starts dumping? Or is this a reaction? Because banks tend to move, at least in my opinion, they tend to move as a herd. Or is this simply, uh, there's so much money out there right now from private private sources that the banks are like, you know, screw it, let's call it a day and move on and, and, and limit our risk. The front running thing I heard that people were trying to get ahead of a deluge of these types of sales, you know, before a bunch of paper clogs up the market in one guy's, you know, assessment. Um, but I also think yeah. your third point applies too, that there's just so much, there's so much money out there. And one thing I heard, one, one reason why the, the momentum could be faster, but is not, is because funds are a little bit slower than banks to un, un, unload these types of loans. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's banks are built to mark stuff down and then make a decision whether to, you know, sell the loan, you know, or close the loan or whatever, you know, uh, but funds, they really, they don't, they're not flipping properties in and out of portfolios because they're buying for the long term, you know, and the, the transaction costs can really screw up the return of a fund. So. Funds are slowly gaining momentum, I would say, in this in this respect. Mr. Cruz, you wrote about banking for a number of years. You still actively uh, monitor the market. Um, I guess what my, my question to you would be is, is this the beginning of the del uh, deluge that we've been hearing about with commercial real estate, especially office space, for a number of years that simply hasn't, it hasn't really seemed to come. There have been a couple of anomalies. And also, too, Mr. Cruz, if you could sort of address the concept of catching a falling knife. You want to get in now and pay. And ultimately, a year from now, everybody looks at you and says, why the hell did you pay that? Why didn't you just wait? So uh, any thoughts, Mr. Gross? Um, Well, a couple of things kind of um, popped into my mind, which is um, I think the regulators have sounded the alarm on um, high concentrations of, uh, of uh, bad performing loans, uh, particularly in the regional and community banks. And regional and community banks, I mean, their, their business is commercial real estate. Uh, so those are the most at risk. And I think you'll see a lot of, a lot of the loans being sold by those institutions. And then, um, you know, uh, uh, the other thing too, is, um, everybody knows this is, is coming. So, uh, I think Mike referred to the fact that, uh, private credit funds, um, private equity funds have been set up exactly for that purpose because they're seeing, you know, they're looking at, you know, 12, 24 months down the road, they're seeing these half empty office buildings and they're, and they're saying to themselves, we can pick, pick stuff up for, you know, pennies on the dollar. And actually, you know, they're starting to do that in a, in a big way. So, um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens next. And then just, what, just one final question, any chance that this, uh, uh, leaps from commercial into residential. When you talk about commercial real estate, I mean, apartments is part of that. Um, and I, I w I'm, I'm thinking that apartments will certainly, I mean, there's been a tsunami of new developments um, and, uh, you know, markets like, um, you know, Austin, uh, Miami and other places where there's been like a, a just an enormous amount of supply come online in a very short time. Um, I think we're going to start seeing some of that happening. So when you're talking about residential, I would think apart the apartment sector would be probably one of the first ones to feel it. I think the point nope. that was made okay. about uh, regulation is, is worth, uh, it has to do with the timing of why <laughs> we're seeing the sales gaining momentum now. It, and, um, I've, I've heard, I heard from my sources that bank regulators have really stepped it up since, uh, since this quick series of bank failures early last year, signature bank, uh, among them, uh, uh of course, Silicon Valley. Uh, bank uh, was probably the best known of these. And there were three of them that failed in very quick succession in the first quarter of last year. And man, I think they, they clamp, they, the, the regulators really clamped down on CRE, commercial real estate exposure at banks after that. And that may be pushing them to, you know, okay, let's mark it down, sell it, take our medicine and move on. This is going to get very interesting. I would imagine. <clears throat> so let, let's go on with story number three. Uh, John Fackler, we're going to go to you with story number three. This is a piece that is coming out of CNN Business. I'm going to read you the headline for a couple of graphs, and I want you to comment. 
There's been a lot of talk uh, as of late because of uh, inflation and rising food costs, especially at restaurants that some people are simply, they're not going out as much. Or if they do go out, they're, they're complaining that the prices are outrageous. There was recently a lot of um, hoopla about uh, a Big Mac uh, uh, value meal at McDonald's going for somewhere in a ballpark of $17 or so. So that's kind of the uh, background for this story, Mr. Backler. So I'll read you the headline. I'll read you the first couple of graphs, and I want you to comment. Headline, Cracker Barrel. And anybody that doesn't know Cracker Barrel, it is a country, old school theme type of restaurant. Makes it feel like you're going to somebody's cottage, maybe somewhere in the rural area. It's typically located off of uh, a number of exits as you're, you're traveling across the United States, but mostly interstate. So that, that's what Cracker Barrel is. So Cracker Barrel is in a battle for relevancy. One of, one of its solutions is surprising. And here we go. First couple graphs, Mr. Fackler. Cracker Barrel uh, CEO Julie Phelps Massino recently gave a devastatingly frank assessment of the brand. We're just not as relevant as we once were. Uh, Massino, who became CEO in July, laid out the diagnosis and remedies in a May presentation to an analyst. And it raises questions for some of those accustomed to the brand's biscuits and gravy, wooden tables and chairs, brain puzzler games, and French porch rocking chairs. And here's a quote from her. The way we communicate, the things on the menu, the way the store looks and feels, all of these things came up time and time again in our research as opportunities for us to really regain relevancy, she said. The revamped Cracker Barrel Country Store, the brand's full name, could include remodeled restaurants with bookcases instead of uh, lattices, dividers, and brand new banquet seating. New Cracker Barrels might be smaller restaurants altogether with menus that include new items like green chili cornbread and banana pudding customers uh may be seen may see brighter interiors with simple decor a move away from the typical cozy clutter mr Fackler, why don't you give us some take about cracker barrel but more importantly uses as a, like a lead-in to what's going on in the restaurant industry well first off i have been to a, a cracker barrel <clears throat> i'm a big lover as you know of uh, uh biscuits and gravy and it, those yeah. are those are one of the menu items they're going to take off, apparently, with the new uh, strategy. But, um, yeah, this is uh, interesting because she's basically, uh, I think it's a she, the CEO, <clears throat> is taking a, a complete uh, jackhammer to everything, including the decor. She's going to change the decor. She's changing the menu. She's changing the time that there will be deals. For example, they're pushing the four to six, which is like back in the day used to be called early birds. And <laughs> uh, I think and the price is going to be lowered. And um, it's just reminiscent of what happened with Red Lobster. As most people know, Red, Bull, Red Lobster is in trouble. They've uh, closed a few of their uh, restaurants. They uh, were talking about bankruptcy. Anybody that doesn't know Red Lobster, um, in case you're watching overseas, it is a, a it, it's a, a dining, casual dining restaurant that specializes in seafood. Please go on, Mr. Beckler. Okay, the big uh, news uh, hook for this story was that they were giving away these uh, uh, shrimp deals, or you could eat shrimp. So people, of course, were flooding, you know, the restaurants and basically took them out at the knees because the costs, you know, of that internally, profit margin-wise, Probably even with their wholesalers, um, destroy them, and they just and they couldn't really. I mean, how do you come back from that? Um, obviously, you stop ordering. I mean, offering free shrimp and all you can eat shrimp. But um, the interesting thing I found in this story and another story was talked about about a dozen to maybe fifteen uh, chains, restaurant chains that are also in trouble. There was a term coined. This is you know, Red Lobster was a very famous brand. Uh, but a term has been coined where they turned it into a verb. It's called red lobster. <laughs> and all these other these restaurant chains are doing the same thing. They're trying to offer a deal, but they're throwing their own costs and their profit margins, you know, in, into uh, suspect because they haven't really, they're trying this out. They haven't really did any sort of uh, testing to see how much, you know, they'll be able to save by doing this. So they go and, Apparently, it's desperation among these retail chains. Uh, there may be some overflow in other retailers, but as far as the restaurant chains, they're really, they're really in trouble. And um, 
you know, if, you, if you've been Red Lobster, you're in trouble. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Fackler, quick question before I open it to the floor. Um, what's been your experience? I, I, how is this playing out in Miami, in South Florida, in terms of local restaurants or smaller chains? Have you seen restaurants close? Have you seen them make any adjustments in pricing? Sure. Are they offering any more uh, happy hour specials? Which I say is a great way to track the, it's a good indicator to track the local economy. Are people spending money if restaurants uh, are doing well, they're not going to offer a happy hour. And if they're struggling, they're going to increase the happy hour. So what, what sort of your take, Mr. Becker? Can you take this story and apply it to what you're seeing on the ground in Miami and in South Florida? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not seeing a lot of deals. Um, I'm a big fan of Uber Eats and they used to, <laughs> They used to give you like 30 bucks off if you do a certain order and this and that. Those deals are gone. I mean, there's occasional deals there, but you can tell that they they bit off more than they can chew. Um, the restaurants, I should say, they're not offering the, you know, 30, 40 percent off like they used to do, you know, during the pandemic and, and post pandemic. A couple of years back, a restaurant in New York and many of them came to South Florida. They set up shop and they were offering a $50 chicken parmesan. $50 chicken parmesan. I've seen situations where a burger at some little place in Coconut Grove is 20 bucks and another fiver if you want to get fries with it. So I guess my question at the round table is, you know, it, 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 are restaurateurs simply too greedy or is inflation really impacting them that much where they can justify these costs? And what kind of shakeout, if any, do you think we could see coming down the pike? Well, I think, um, I think restaurant expenses have spiraled out of control. I mean, uh, Labor costs, uh, insurance, uh, retail space, um, all, all of those expenses uh, have really uh, increased for restaurants and their margins have been, you know, squeezed. Um, and the only way they can make up the difference is by raising prices. And I think we've seen a lot of that, uh, but I think we've seen the limit of it um, because I think um, a lot of restaurants in Miami, I know are a lot of restaurants are going to be closing this summer. There's a lot of talk about uh, empty restaurants. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm reading news almost every week of a restaurant closing. Yep. I mean, you know, I don't know if that's just, um, uh, you know, the typical sort of summer turnover, uh, that we see in South Florida, um, during the slow season, a lot of restaurants close and, uh, new concepts move in, in the winter time. But, um, I think a lot of those costs are, are really impacting restaurants and, um, uh, it's going to, it's going to be really tough for, for restaurants to make a go of it. There's profit margin pressure I've heard too on restaurants. This a tourism expert was saying to my uh, my girlfriend uh, the other day that uh, younger people may be showing up for that those early bird dinners, and they're also not buying alcohol like their their parents and their grandparents did before them uh, when they mm. went out to eat. They're less big. They they don't they just don't drink as much. I mean, her her both of her sons are very much. I mean, they're not against drinking, but you know they're pretty much teetotalers when they go out to eat. You know, so this is a big profit margin to be losing if you're a restaurant and you're serving beer, wine, and liquor. But I I don't know. Do you get the same impression that young people don't get boozed up as much as our generation? I I think it's true. You know, it could be. And, and you know, but, but I'd say that the, the, the flip side of that is we're going to have an, uh, an item on the ballot this upcoming election talking about legalizing recreational marijuana in Florida. Who knows? Maybe that provides a boost to all these rest restaurant tours where after the guys hit it a little bit, they get the munchies. So we'll have to stay tuned and see if anybody takes advantage of that opportunity, assuming it passes and the legislature actually puts it in place. Let's go on with story number four. Jean Gris, we're going to go to you with story number four. This is a piece that is coming out of, um, NBC2 Fort Myers out of the west coast of Florida, uh, the Gulf of Mexico side, if you will. Uh, John, you spent some years out there. You were a journalist. Um, uh, 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 you were an editor. Uh, you wrote about it. So you have a pretty good uh, feel for kind of what's going on. And if anybody doesn't know where Fort Myers is, it's going to be south of uh, Tampa and it's going to be north of Naples. And why what's sort of one of its claim to fame? That area is, was, was featured in the movie The Big Short, which took a look at the housing crash back in uh, 2008, 2009, 2007 area. So let me go ahead and read you the headline. First couple of graphs, Sean. NBC2 out of Fort Myers. Again, headline. Thousands of Southwest Florida condos for sale as owners face rising assessments and insurance costs. And here we go. 
Many Southwest Florida condo owners are in trouble financially as they face thousands of dollars in special assessments. There's a rush of people putting their condos up for sale and buyers are shying away. Florida is now facing a condo crisis as more condos are on the market than there have been in years. North Fort Myer residents in Foxmore Lakes neighborhood are seeing special assessments added to their already high price insurance. Uh, Kristen Moose, M-O-O-S. I just want to say, Kristen, if you see this, it says Moose. Maybe it's Moose. I'm not sure how to say it, but Kristen Moose, M-O-O-S, uh, and her husband are retired and face a special assessment of $2,450, which is due in August. She and many of her neighbors are scrambling to come up with the extra cash. And here's a quote from Miss Moose. It's very difficult because we didn't budget for this. We just paid at the beginning of the year $2,000 for flood insurance, and now we're hit with this assessment. Mr. Groose, uh, what do you make of this? Is this the first sign of the Florida condo market uh, really starting to uh, come to realization of what this 2025 condo Association of Financial Cliff is, which is all in reaction to the collapse of the Surfside Condo Tower in 2021 on the Barrier Island outside of uh, downtown Miami, just north of Miami Beach and just south of Aventura and uh, Sunny House. Yeah, not not just that, but remember two years ago, Hurricane Ian, uh, that's categ right, Category Five hurricane uh, hit Southwest Florida and and caused widespread destruction. Um, so. Yeah, you got a lot of problems there. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I did live in uh, Southwest Florida for uh, uh, about 15 years or so. And um, through the uh, through the boom and the bust. And I mean, it was the epicenter of the foreclosure crisis. It truly was um, because it's a super speculative market. I mean, the um, the origins of Fort Myers and uh, the surrounding communities have all been sort of the speculative land booms um, uh, that have hit Florida. Uh, in succession and um, uh, communities like Cape Coral um, yeah, have, were, were basically land scams. <laughs> uh, in Florida? And, no yeah. way. <laughs> I mean, on an epic scale. And um, so, you know, this, is, this has continued through the years. And um, so, so really Southwest Florida is sort of a canary in a coal mine. Um, when, when you're looking at uh, spec speculative frenzies, which is basically you know, what happens in Florida every 10, 20 years. So we get, we get sort of these booms and busts and they get accentuated in Southwest Florida. And, um, you know, we just had it, we just came off, a, another spectacular boom in Southwest Florida. And now we're starting to see the bust happening. Uh, and you know, it's just, it's the story of Florida. It's, um, we've seen this before. Those of us who have lived in Florida for decades, I mean, this is, this is the story of Florida boom and bust. And, um, but, in Southwest Florida, you you see it, um, you know, see the higher highs and the lower lows, and uh, we're we're starting to see a lot of that. Of course, that you know presents opportunities for investors. I mean, if you're an investor in distressed properties, I mean, it's time to get some dry powder and start snooping around. Um, and Southwest Florida might be just the perfect place to do that. Start snooping around, uh, Mr. Seamith and Mr. Fackler. You've both been here since the '80s. Um, I thought a thousand people are moving to Florida a day. That's what we keep hearing from the Convention of Visitor Bureau types. If we had a thousand people a day coming to Florida, surely some of them will go to Southwest Florida and take advantage of some of these condos that are suddenly flooding the market. Or am I getting that wrong on the number of people coming or uh, their, the desirability of Southwest Florida? Anybody have any comments? Well, Southwest Florida is more affordable than Southeast Florida. So that would be a point in Southwest Florida's favor. Uh, uh, I, I, I was interviewing somebody about a month ago who was, who was, who was arguing that the, the narrative that a lot of tech companies and tech employees were moving to Southeast Florida was a little misinformed since the AI revolution really kicked into full gear. Now they're all being called back. This guy told me to headquarters in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. So a little bit of that is not happening because they, they need to come home and work on AI. That's what this guy was telling me. I didn't use it because it just seemed kind of flimsy, but I thought it'd be good for this pod. It was kind of an interesting idea. Hey, that's a great point. The Wall Street Journal. Yeah, the Wall Street Journal about, I don't know, two months ago or so, they did a story <laughs> about that exact scene thing with VC money, uh, uh, VC uh, fund managers who were based in Miami 
in South Florida during the pandemic, suddenly going back up there uh, to work on the next great revolution, which is AI. Um, Mr. Factor, let me ask you, you've been in Florida since the 80s uh, from New York. Um, has it always been a thousand people a day moving to Florida? Have you heard that uh, going back those 40 plus years that you've been down here? Or, um, or is this a new, a new type of thing? I always thought it was a chamber of commerce thing because when I was reporting, um, we were hearing about the thousand people a day every, every year, basically for, you know, 10, 20 years. So I don't know if that's just a mantra from the, you know, uh, chamber of commerce people, or if it's actually true. I interesting point. Uh, interesting discussion, uh, gentlemen, let's go on with our next story. Story number five. Um, Mike Seamus, we're going to go to you with story number five. This piece you wrote and appeared in the Commercial Observer. I'll read you the headline for a couple of graphs, and I want you to provide some insight. You wrote the piece, so you might not be able to comment, but you can give us some insight, and then we'll open up to the floor for a discussion. Here we go again, Commercial Observer. Headline, as Miami's multifamily market moderates, new challenges emerge. And I should mention, Mike, this piece actually appeared uh, back in the first quarter of 2024. I wanted to uh, discuss it, though, because you're on the podcast in season five. This is our first opportunity to sort of kick it around because multifamily is such a critical part of what's going on down here in South Florida. So we'll go on with the first couple graphs. Miami MERS is a migration magnet during COVID-19 pandemic and encouraging a boom in rental market construction. Now, rent growth has flattened as those new apartments hit the market and debt-dependent developers struggle to build more. But no one expects flat rents and decelerated apartment construction to last long in Miami, especially if the area is being a bulging population of newcomers continues to grow. And here's a quote we have from a... Um, a uh, general contractor called Cast Construction. The guy's name is uh, Michael Neal. He's the CEO. His quote is, Miami is still, in my view, the most robust market in the state. Quote uh, goes on to say, I'm hearing universally uh, from all my clients that the lending environment is incredibly restrictive. We saw that at the start. Uh, we saw that start to happen in the second quarter of 2023, and it's only gotten worse, Neal said. Uh, Mr. Uh, Seaman, this piece came out in the first quarter. We're now in the second quarter of uh, 2024. The winter season is over. Now we're getting into the summer. Uh, things might have changed, but generally speaking, why don't you kind of uh, share with us some insight you learned uh, while reporting out this piece about multifamily in, in, in South Florida as well as state of Florida? Well, I think it was interesting how Michael Neal time-stamped, time put his time stamp on the problem with uh, um, financing for multifamily construction. Um, and that's his business. He's a contractor. He should know, right? Uh, he said it was the second quarter of 2023, mm -hmm. which would have been immediately after Signature Bank, Silicon Valley Bank. And I'm sorry, I can I always forget the, the name of the third one, but there were three in quick succession that failed in the first quarter. And I think things changed at the FDIC and the Federal Reserve after that in terms of their kind of a crackdown on, on commercial real estate exposure. Um, you know, and I, and I had another, I had a developer tell me in this story that the big problem that they were facing was that the cost of everything was way too high compared to when they bought the land and they got the entitlements. Um, you know, insurance is up, construction costs is up, construction labor is up. Uh, obviously, interest rates remain high, elevated anyway. And, um, and now he said, there's a new obstacle is that banks don't even, don't even want to offer credit at any price, you know, if it's a multifamily project. Really? So they've turned off the spigot. That's, the spigot is that's closed. That's the vibe I was getting when I was talking to him and a couple other developers for this story is that, you know, no loss, you know. And I think we, I, I, there's a local example. I'm not going <laughs> to name the developer in Hollywood. But there's a developer sure. in Hollywood who's got sure. some big plans downtown. And they are only unfolding one at a time. And I've heard behind the scenes that that's because that's the way the lenders want it. They're not gonna not gonna they're not gonna fund two massive projects at once. And they both have huge multifamily elements to them, along with commercial elements, mixed mixed use projects. So, um, um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of kind of ghost projects out there, as you know, Peter and. You guys, you other guys too, I'm sure. I, I or just wrote about one for Fort Lauderdale Magazine. Dependable Equities is based in Brooklyn, and they have two very big multifamily projects um, that that have been planned but have not been executed in Fort Lauderdale. And both of them are over 400 units. And 
One of them is south of the river downtown. One of them is north. The site they've had north of the river, they've owned for, let's say, a year. And the one south of the river, they've owned for three or four years. And they've got them entitled. And, and I've visited the sites, and they look just like they did three or four years ago. There's One has a building on it. One's just vacant. And this, so anyway, it's... I think it has moderated, but as as the article pointed out, you know, if if this in migration continues at a thousand or nine hundred or however many people a day it is, um, that that will that will take this take the top to take the ceiling off rents, which I think rents have kind of bumped up against the ceiling a little bit down here, but uh, we'll see. You know, I mean, I. I negotiated with my client on this story just to talk about the Miami-Dade market. I didn't talk about Broward or Palm Beach, but I think you would find similar trends in both of those markets as well. It's just hard to get multifamily projects developed. It's just hard to get construction financing for them. It's, and it's, there's a lot of obstacles right now, you know. You know, the big advantage is a lot of people moving here. And I believe it probably is a thousand a day at this point because, you know, I think it might have been hype before, but I don't think it's hype anymore. Well, all we need is one really bad uh, hurricane season. <laughs> that'll that'll change. They'll like all back in 04, 05, when you had Gene and all the other hurricanes going around and everybody fled. Remember? I do. I remember well. Um, Mr. Gruss, let me ask you a question. You 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 covered banking. Uh, you written about banking. Um, you know, developers are paid. They get a lot of publicity down here in South Florida. There's a lot of kissing of the ring, if you will. If you're a developer. Basically, everybody wants you in the community because they're going to look for some way to make money off you. Whether they're selling you land, they're selling your condos, they're selling you tile. They're you know they're doing something for you. But I would argue the real money is the bankers. You don't hear a lot about the bankers. You can't tell one from the other. They're all cautiously optimistic. They don't say anything unique, uh, generally speaking. But they're really the ones with the with the power, from my perspective, my 30 years in South Florida. Um, so I guess, Mr. Cruz, what, what I'm asking you is, if Mr. Seamus says, I'm reporting out his piece, that the bankers have turned off the spigot for financing a multifamily um, is that much more important than uh, developers saying that they're trying to go forward, but uh, could take a little bit longer? So, so you know, how critical is it that bankers have um, uh, apparently turned off the financing spigot for multifamily for South Florida? Well, well, I mean, the thing is, is that the, the bankers have turned off the spigot because the regulators have told them that they can't uh, grow their commercial real estate loan portfolio until they clean up their act. I mean, they clean up what they have now. Uh, and and the risk, you know, the the um, the risk of over concentration in multifamily, and um, you know, investors in the regional banks have already you know clobbered them um, <laughs> for 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 having you know being overexposed in certain in certain markets um, like Austin or even Miami, um, and I mean you you're starting to read about those, um, but I. I, um, I what I found really interesting is uh, the appearance of uh, private equity and private capital, private credit. Um, those guys are showing up um, and they're funding some of these uh, projects. But, you know, what's interesting to me is you never you never know like what what the cost of capital is. It's never reported. And uh, I'd be really interested to know, you know, the pound of flesh that they're like extracting uh <laughs> I'm sure I, you know, this is not, um, it's not cheap money, um, but it is money. So <laughs> I mean, uh, and, there, and some of these projects are moving ahead and you, you got to scratch your head. Like but, uh, what cost, you know, what is, what is the financing structure look like? And, you know, a lot of these apartments and a lot of these new developments are a luxury, you know, luxury developments. Well, they're luxury developments because they can't afford to build like anything at the mid range or, or low end. I mean, it's, 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 it's all got to be luxury because they got to charge a premium because they got to cover, you know, the financing costs, the insurance costs, labor costs, all of those costs to build. So anything you're seeing now that's being built is like ultra super luxury 
with re- sky high rents, you know, and and the 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 slick amenities, you know, at the the rooftop pools and the yeah yeah, and, the yeah. Ca- and the cabanas and the and the parking elevators <laughs> <laughs> and the and the uh, the name brands, uh, you know, yeah. on these uh, on these buildings, yeah. Interesting conversation. Let's go with story number six. Uh, John Fackler, we're going to go to you with story number six. This week's coming on the Miami Herald. Um, Mr. Fackler, you've been our go-to guy when we're talking about uh, white-collar crime, talking about issues related to condo associations. You've lived in one. Uh, you've had some incidents. So you're always able to give us some like great uh, context. So here we go with the headline. First couple graphs from Mr. Fackler, and then what you have comment. Headline, dispute involving condo's new parking scheme lands in court makes local news. And here we go with the first couple graphs. With so many South Florida, Florida condominium communities experiencing financial challenges, some associations and their board of directors may wish to develop a new source of revenue to help mitigate raising owners' monthly dues or implementing special assessments. However, as the recent litigation involving the Buckley Condo Tower uh, condominium illustrates, devising a questionable new parking payment scheme and deploying it by tolling away many owners Vehicles overnight is extremely unlikely to be a recipe for success. In fact, the Northeast Miami-Dade County community, those tactics landed its former director in court and its crosshair of state regulars, and they also drew the attention of NBC6 News. According to allegations brought by Francis Trulenke and several fellow unit owners, some members of the Buckley Towers Board of Directors took advantage of their position to profit financially from the community. Mr. Packman, why don't you explain the rest of it uh, to us what exactly was this kind of board doing? How are they, how are these individuals on the board profiting personally? And what were they doing to the uh, the rights, uh, if you will, of the unit owners who had assigned parking spaces? What um, uh, Give us an overview, Mr. Vackler. Well, apparently they called it the uh, uh, tow truck massacre because in one day, literally overnight, uh, 12, <laughs> 12, 12 of them showed up and and literally absconded with their cars. Apparently there was some post its around the around the area that they could see. But listen, I you know, I'm not a real estate aficionado like you, but as far as I know, when you buy a condo in a tower, old tower, new tower, the parking space is part of the deal. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's done separately. You ought to know better than anybody. So I don't understand how how they can do this end around where they come back and they're basically putting a premium on certain spots. Let's say it's, you know, a spot near a penthouse or whatever. And if you don't come up with that money, you're getting it. You're, you're getting, you're giving up your spot. I don't know how that's even legal. I mean, is that, is that why they're suing them? I'm assuming that's why there's a lawsuit because it's, it seems insane to me. I mean, we're starting to see a lot of panicking going on, you know, with, with the new regulations coming on with the construction and, end of the, the end of the year issues. So people have to come up with money, you know, to pay these special assessments. So I think there was a lot of panicking going on. Okay, we're not going to be able to make it, you know, this end of year uh, changes. So we're going to find some other way to make money. But to do that, to go around, I mean, it, it, it just seems stupid that they were going to get caught eventually by the owners, the ownerships. So, Mr. Vacker, let me ask you a follow-up question before we open up to the floor. Uh, you said you're not like a real estate guy, you, you know, whatever. But you own and you live in a place. What would you do if uh, you parked in the proper space as a sign by your association or, or your landlord? You come out in the morning, your car is gone. I know you've had some experience where you've gotten towed before. I think you, why would you pay in the past 300, 400 bucks or so for the towing? But what would be your reaction, Mr. Vacker, if you were playing by the rules as laid out? And all of a sudden, you got hooked. You had to schlep on down to some tow yard. You had to pay cash only because they never take credit. And you had to worry that maybe somebody did something in the back of your car that smelled like urine after the fact. So what would you do, Mr. Beckham, if that were you? Well, as you know, Peter, I've been hooked before. So I know the experience, <laughs> I know the experience of being hooked is very stressful and, and, you know, demoralizing. But, you know, at the same point, I wasn't paying or a parking spot. I mean, that's not where I got hooked. I got hooked for, you know, at a club or whatever. So, you know, it, it just seems to me like it's, 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 it, it's, it's common sense that it's in the contract. Uh, you pay for a certain spot. You're going to pay the same price, I assume. And now these guys are trying to put a premium on certain spots. 
And if you don't come up with that extra money, you're getting jacked. And I, I just don't understand how it's legal. That, that's what I'm saying. So, so, so let me ask um, uh, Mr. Gruss or Mr. Seamoth. Um, I've owned some condominiums and I'll just sort of tell you my experience. I'm not an attorney. Chuck, well, you're an attorney. But basically what happens is you, my experience, when I bought a condo, I would get parking spaces. And I had the right to a parking space. And then what the association would do is they would simply assign it to me. So I didn't, I didn't have that particular spot. I had the assignment for that particular spot. Oh. And then if I wanted to pay to purchase a different one or take somebody out or whatever the case may be, I would simply get the assignment. But I didn't actually have the real estate where I could go and I could set up shop. Now, I oh, really? do know from individual friends who've gone around, there's actually some associations where it's deeded. That particular spot is deeded to you and you right. pay property tax on that particular spot. Right. So just to sort of clarify for the audience, again, I'm not an attorney, check with your attorney, but that's been my sort of experience. But Mr. Seamoth, Mr. Groose, um, you know, uh, associations, they can just take the spot that was assigned to you. They can, re you know, wipe it all away and start from scratch and put it out for open bidding. Uh, have you guys ever heard <laughs> well, or seen anything well, I like always, that? I always thought that the parking uh, was common area. So if, if the association decides to charge for the parking, um, I'm sure it's within their uh, purview to put it to a vote of the condo association board and decide to charge for parking. And if you don't pay for your parking, you get towed. I mean, I, I, unless of course you have a deeded spot, but I've never heard of a condo having a deeded, a deeded parking spot. Um, I, 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 was, do know I, was, okay. yeah. I do know guys, I do know guys. Because okay. so the condo law went into place in the uh, early 60s, late 50s. But I do know guys early on uh, where parking spaces were deeded. So some friends of mine yeah. have actually gone through, they figured out the old buildings, and they've actually purchased that particular parking space. Okay. Where, and, they, and, and the way the condo association docks were, they were able to buy it without buying a unit. And then what they did is they turned around and rented it out. Oh, so yeah. I just know that from personal Oops. experience. But, but, well, but that's very okay. unique. You've got a lot of condo buildings now that are scrambling for cash. They're scrambling to shore up their finances and they're trying to find any way they can to shore up their finances and, and, and get some money into the, into their reserves. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff happen. Oh yeah. And, and, and if I can add some insight to that before you answer, Mr. Beckler, according to the story, the association received approximately 28 grand in 11 days from the new parking revenue stream. So these are people who used to park for free, if you will. Now all of a sudden they're paying 28 grand because they want a preferred spot. Um, Mr. Beckler, any thoughts? Well, I've had a condo, an old condo, and I've had a relatively new townhouse. I didn't have a, a diddy spot, I just had a spot. So, uh, which is going back to Jean's point, uh, it's probably not that common to have a diddy uh, spot. Um, but I just think if, if it is deeded, you should know about it, obviously, in the contract when you buy the house or buy the condo. So um, I, I just, just wondered, did these guys not see it in their contracts or was it, is it, is it a move point, like you said? M M M well, I would say, I would think you, Mr. Feckler, you know, it's posted on Interstate 95 what the speed limit is. So there's one thing that's posted and there's another thing the way people simply operate. <laughs> But then, lo and behold, if you get pulled over, you're going to get written for a ticket for that. But in reality, you know, the life's a little bit different than what's what's posted. But, um, Mr. Seamoth, why don't you wrap this all up for us? Um, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about condominium associations overnight because they're hurting for cash, suddenly wiping clean everybody's assigned parking space, creating havoc, putting it up for auction? It almost sounds kind of uh, ingenious. Well, it sounds desperate, <laughs> is what it sounds like to me. I mean, it just sounds like. You know, yeah, it sounds desperate. Definitely, there, there can't a special assessment cannot be far behind, right? If, if we're if we're char if we're taking people's parking spaces away from them, the flip side of this, I was thinking while you guys were talking, was that I watch a lot of developers before city commissions trying to get site plan approval for the fewest number of parking spaces possible, and they're winning these arguments because. You know, we're in the age of Uber, right? We're in the age of ride sharing. And, um, you know, it's, uh, that's, and a lot of the multifamily projects that I'm looking at or that are being debated are in urban areas. And it's, um, it's very expensive to produce parking. You know, it's a very valuable resource, you know, it turns out. 
but you should be careful if you're buying into a new place, either buying into it or renting into it, uh, just how many parking places they have for you because they are, they are winning these arguments with city commissions. My old employer, the Tampa Tribune, used to charge employees for parking in, in its parking garage that it owned. <laughs> That's how yeah, bad at least you were paid well. Were. Should have worked for the That's same big times. The you, you could park out back for free. I know. <laughs> Interesting conversation. I will say if anybody has any questions about how to go forward, do like I did 11 years ago. Give up your car. And then when you do have a parking space, simply rent it out for somebody who's willing to pay top dollar. I, I'm not getting anything like the 28 Gs. These guys made it 11 days. But let me tell you, it can be profitable, assuming you buy in the right location. So all that being said, let me go ahead and thank everybody for participating in this week's podcast. This is episode number 11 of season five. Let me thank John Gruce. He was a journalist for over 25 years. Right now, he has his own public relations marketing firm called Gruce Communications. Check out his website, GrucePR.com, G-R-U-S-S-P-R.com. You want to send him a message. You can get him at uh, on X, which is formerly Twitter. You can get him at John Gruce, J-E-A-N-G-R-U-S-S. I also want to thank John Fackler. He was a journalist for over 20 years, wrote by White Collar Crime. Right now, he does public relations and marketing. Mr. Fackler can be reached on X, which is formal with Twitter. Get him an ad, J-T Fackler, J-T-F-A-K-L-E-R. Also, too, congratulations to you, Mr. Fackler, for launching your brand new newsletter and podcast called Jet Up Miami. It's on Substack, Jet Up Miami, which is on Substack. And if you're a Miami Dolphin fan, make sure you sign up and you give them a piece of your mind at the how good the New York Jets are going to be, given the fact Mr. Fackler was based here in Miami Dolphins territory for the NFL. And I want to thank Mike Seameth. Mike's been a journalist for over 35 years, originally from Iowa, as he shared with us. His work appears in a variety of publications, including The Real Deal and Commercial Observer, as well as Fort Lauderdale Magazine. Thanks for participating, Mike. And we want to get a hold of him. Get him on X, which is formerly Twitter, at Mike Seameth, M-I-K-E-S-E-E-M-U-T-H. And I'm Peter Zalewski of Condo Vultures. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you have any questions for us, any comments, go ahead and reach out to us on X, formerly Twitter. It uh, you get us at Miami RRP at Miami RRP, which stands for Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast, not AARP, but Miami RRP. And then don't forget, um, my company's a sponsor of the podcast. Check out our website, condovultures.com, and sign up or look into the Miami Condo Market Investing Club, where we share all kind of information. If you are a DIYer, you want to do it on your own, you don't want to pay a realtor, we got all the stats and the expertise we can help you uh, with your search. You do it on your own, but we'll we'll feed you the data. So. Until next time, hope everybody takes care of themselves and we'll catch up soon. Ciao, ciao. It's a simple formula and it works. Buy low, sell high. We're Condo Vultures. And when it comes to your real estate, we help you buy low. At Condo Vultures, we represent the buyer. And now's the time to buy. Log on to CondoVultures.com for more information. CondoVultures.com. And remember, before you sell high, you have to buy low. Featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, 60 Minutes, and Time Magazine. Condo Vultures Realty, a licensed Florida real estate brokerage capitalizing on the condo correction since 2006. Don't buy a South Florida condo discounted or distressed before taking a Condo Vultures correction tour. CondoVultures.com offers weekly bus and walking tours that focus on educating buyers on the how-tos of identifying discounted condos, analyzing the opportunities, and purchasing units. Every tour attendee receives a list of all condo projects in a particular market, a market assessment handout, and unmatched expert analysis. For more information on the condo correction tours, please visit condovultures.eventbrite.com.